the biggest mistake that I find with uh, new real estate investors is that they provide too much money upfront toward the these contractors or trace people. And as a result, they lose control because they, they don't have clear defined strategies and goals associated with this re- renovation. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, now offering a $250 per unit project allowance to new clients in West Michigan. Find out more at livegreenlocal.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at RCB Associates. Associates, LLC.com. Hello and welcome to episode 312. One of the biggest challenges both new and seasoned investors encounter in rental property investing is completing a successful rehab project. There are many ways a project can go wrong and blow your budget. My guest today is going to talk us through the do's and don'ts of a successful rehab and share tips on how to save money on renovations. Van Sturgeon is an experienced entrepreneur, developer, general contractor, and rehabber who owns over 1,000 properties across North America. He's passionate about helping homeowners and investors overcome their fears of house renovations, and he loves to help people reach their goals. Van, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Brian. I've been looking forward to this interview for, for a while now, so I'm an admirer of yours. I've listened to many of your podcasts, so I appreciate you having me. And I've been looking forward to talking with you because I always love getting into the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty of investing. And your topic is, is right in that lane. It's like how to do it right, how, to, how not to do it wrong. But before we go there, just tell us a little bit about your background and how you gained all this experience over the, the past years. I was born in the 60s to an immigrant family, I lived in Chicago. And my brother and I, the family were in a one-bedroom apartment and like every family, their hopes were to be able to save up enough money to be able to buy their dream home, my parents. And as things, as they're accumulating money, working hard, they found out that the building that we were living in actually had gone up for sale. And so instead of going out and you know, buying that dream home, they made a decision to, to become landlords. And so they went out and scrounged together all the monies that they could, put it down, uh, down payment and became landlords. So it started off wonderfully. And then unfortunately, the late 70s started to kick in. It was a miserable time with inflation rate skyrocketing. Unemployment rate was through the roof. It was just a miserable period of time. And that lovely little building that my parents had purchased but pretty quickly started experiencing 40, 50, 60% vacancy. And as a family, we had to sort of, you know, this was our singular biggest investment that my parents had ever made. And we had to figure out something. So as a family, we did everything ourselves in the whether it's painting, you know, carpet cleaning, cleaning toilets, uh, thousands of toilets I've cleaned in my lifetime, Brian. And as a family, we had to figure it all out. And th- that was the background to be able to take us through this, this, this miserable time. It was, it was a period in Chicago where landlords couldn't hold on to their properties because of so many vacancies that they literally would torture their buildings to collect insurance money from them. It was just a miserable time. So as a family, we had to figure it all out. And and that's where I had that background in, in landlording and, and contracting and, and doing repairs. I went off to university, graduated, disappointed my parents. They wanted me to be of the three-piece suit and alligator shoes, you know, that kind of be a lawyer. I decided against that and I wanted to get into construction, into renovations. I, and it was something that I, that I was born into and I enjoyed. And so I opened up my general contracting business in the late 80s, early 90s, went out there, tried to create the relationships and grow my business. And what happened was I kept running into these same people, these real estate investors who would purchase properties, would hire a guy like me or, and renovate them. And then, then either they would flip them or they would hold on to them and create rental portfolios. And and that's where I got exposed to that side of the business. And so in conjunction with working and developing a general contracting business, I started to dabble in real estate in, in the early 1990s. And one thing led to another. And uh, today I've got over probably closer to 1,200 properties. I've been very blessed. I have uh, several uh, successful businesses, whether it's building homes and renovations and restoration work, a commercial restoration work. And right now I'm sort of, I'm semi-retired. I'm just, I have really great people uh, that are looking after my businesses and, 
And I'm at that stage in my life where I sort of downshifted. I love that trajectory there. You're, by the way, where did your family immigrate from? Macedonia. You're in Chicago. I'd imagine this was an older building. Like, What kind of building was this that your family ended up buying? It was an older building built in the 50s. It was a smaller building and it was just fully occupied and everything was fine in that, uh, in that part. And then eventually, as I mentioned, like the... It was a very, it was a quick, rapid area. Like things, just issues started to prop up all over the place with regards to just the economy and and just in the environment that that we were happening to live in. Then give us some examples. So th- this is your introduction to rental property ownership as a family. You're a young man. What were some of the the actual challenges that this building presented that you had to learn on the spot to fix? On the actual, on the renovation side, whenever there's a turn on apartment, there's things that need to be done, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And if you have to hire, either you'll hire a general contractor who will look after that, or you you can sub it out and you can hire the painter, electrician, whatever to do that. But if you have a little bit of this and a little bit of that to get done, it can get very expensive because there's mobilization costs. And so as a, uh, back then, we couldn't afford to spend money on a painter or electrician. So we had to figure it out on our own. So, you know, replacing an electrical outlet or a switch to, you know, cleaning our own carpet and these, you know, when there's a turn, those were the things that we had to pick up because we wanted to need to save money. The real difficult period, the difficulty during that period of time was that you had to create a differentiator in the marketplace to be able to get that apartment rented because there were so vacancy, vacancy rates were so high. And so that was more of a struggle that that took a period of time to figure out. Was your family able to keep this property? Were they able to successfully get over this hump and these challenges to keep the property? Absolutely. And it was the smartest decision that they could have made in holding onto that property. If, if real estate is, there's, if you're able to write it out and you do the, the numbers, you crunch the numbers, absolutely. They held on to it and they did very well. So I, I really want to dig into the nuts and bolts of, of rehab projects and the do's and don'ts, how to do it right, how to do it wrong, and how not to do it wrong. So take us through a rehab project and what people should be considering before they even get started. It's a process that I've developed over over the you know th- literally thousands of renovations, whether it's uh, on my own properties or for others. And it really starts where... It's establishing a goal for the actual renovation. Oftentimes, I find, especially on the single family, on the single family side, there isn't a goal, a clear defined goal with regards to what it is they're looking to accomplish on a property. Whether that is to do a flip and you want to make thirty thousand dollars on that flip, to holding on to that property, wanting to turn it into a rental, there should be some clear defined goal as to what it is that you're looking to accomplish with the property. And once you have that goal, you need to go out there in the marketplace and. And validate it. You got to get in there and you got to get that information from the current market conditions. So if you're looking to do a flip, you've got to get in there and find out what are comparable properties sold for that for that price and determine what it is exactly those apartments have. If it's on a multifamily side, also, you know, in your due diligence phase, when you're uh, when you're when you're crunching the numbers and figuring out whether this is a, a purchase that makes sense. You really uh, uh, you need to get into the actual the finer details associated with that particular apartment in comparison or that building in comparison to others out there in the marketplace. How many square feet do you need to purchase stainless steel appliances? Those are the types of things that are needed in order to be able to get to the point where you understand fully what it is that you need to accomplish with this renovation. And once you have that, 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 that information you need to do an assessment of the actual apartment. It's, I mean, I'm sorry, the actual property itself, whether it's an apartment building, whether it's a single family home, you have to go through it and, and creating what I call a needs and wants list, where it's an actual inventory of the property and determining what needs to get done. Like if there's a roof that's, that's a leak, that's a need. If there's a window that's broken, that's a need. But sometimes items that you would think that are needs, people uh, confuse them and they put them under a needs section. But in real reality, it's it's a want. For example, windows, a window upgrade. Oftentimes, you know, depending on your particular situation and the amount of money that you have, you know, those are just, sometimes you can delay you know, a capital improvement like that because it can be very expensive. So those are the types of things where people need to do an assessment of their property determining. And that's one of the difficulties that I find new real estate investors have is that they have 
they have a general idea of what it is that they need to do, but the actual put it down into really clear defined steps and processes is what's lacking and what's missing. And that's what you that's what that's what you need. I'm sure I know that you have that all yourself, Brian. In that you have processes and systems to be able to take an asset and, and go through that whole process of getting you to the end where it's a successful renovation. And often, new real estate investors lack that. And also, new real estate investors don't know what they don't know. So, like when they're going through and looking at the different components. Should they be doing this themselves or should they have a, a contractor or someone with them for more experienced pair of eyes? Unfortunately, it's a catch-22, isn't it? And that right now in this overheated real estate market, there's only a limited amount of time that you have to be able to determine what the renovation re- rehab cost is and, and then use you know do the arithmetic to determine whether this is a great deal or not. And as I said, this is which comes first, a chicken or the egg? And that you need to have this experience, but at the same time, how do you acquire this experience? To hire, to get a general contractor to go out with you, sometimes it just isn't feasible. And then also at the same time, to hire a property inspector can cost you three to five hundred dollars. And just you sometimes just don't have the time. If you got a smoking great deal, those don't last very long. So if it isn't, if you don't, if you can't make that pull the trigger, then ultimately somebody else will. So it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult situation, and I don't know how f- folks need to an- how they will answer that as prop- as as new uh, investors walking in and trying to acquire their first property. It's it's a difficult animal. Well, how would you suggest they answer that? I mean, is there a, a rule of thumb that they can use when they walk through a property? Is there some way they can narrow it down if they're not quite sure what they're looking at or what they're getting into? There's got to be some metric by which they can decide what their offer should be or what they what kind of money they should put into this project. There are some generic numbers or averages that they can use to apply to to come up with a dollar sum, a lump sum associated with the what the renovation rehab cost is. But unfortunately, it's it's just a ballpark number that can, that can be applied, but it doesn't truly give you a, an understanding of what the costs are associated with this particular renovation rehab. So some of those numbers usually are in that, depending on the market, can be anywhere between thirty to fifty dollars a square foot, and that's the number that you apply for a renovation associated with the property that you're looking to flip. Those are the kind of numbers that are floating around. Again, it's all geographically based. Some areas that might be more, some areas would be less. At this stage of assessment, where have you seen a lot of investors go wrong? Like an investor who would say, "Oh, I'm only going to need five thousand dollars to do this flip." ends up spending $30,000 for some reason. What, what do they typically overlook at this stage? Again, it comes back to clearly understanding what it is that they're looking to accomplish with this particular renovation rehab and understanding the marketplace. And as I touched on earlier, I find that a lot of properties are over-renovated and it's just simply because they just have a lack of understanding of just getting by what it, uh, and getting the highest ROI. Like things on uh, the single family side, there's things that I would be, I get the highest ROI and things like doing curb appeal items, uh, landscaping, painting the windows and the doors and the exterior of the property. Those are some th- things that give you, provide you with the highest ROI in compar- versus in going in and renovating a kitchen or a bathroom. So those are the types of decisions that seasoned real estate investors are able to make. And as a result, are able to get to the point where they are successful, or at least they be able to get their, to hit their budget. And it's right now, one of the difficult things that I find new real estate investors have is trying to identify contractors that are willing to actually good bona fide contractors are willing to come to a property to actually even provide you a quote, never mind actually doing the work. And that's something to do with actually having a detailed scope of work that needs to be put together. I find that a lot of new real estate investors, even old ones, are going through that process and putting together so that you have a clear understanding of what it is that you're looking to accomplish in that renovation. The difficulty of finding contractors come through and help give you a sense of what the numbers are going to be. Is this a recent phenomenon because of COVID and then just lack of people actually out there working right now? Or has this been the case for much longer? It's always been the case. A good contractors or tradespeople have relationship that they've established and 
They usually they uh, and and they they look after their their customers. I who've been in the business for for, for the, as many years as I have been, I have a of, have a handful of go to people that I that I go to, that I use, and they are willing to come out and and do the necessary work associated with putting numbers together for the costs associated with uh, with their involvement. And you folks get coming into the marketplace looking for that kind of those types of individuals to quote. Need to understand that as a general contractor or trace person, there's time and, and money involved ultimately in putting a quote together. And if you don't have that re- have that relationship with that individual, then you're not going to find that individual is just going to say they're busy and not willing to put in the time and effort. And so that's where I am a big proponent for folks that want to get serious and become serious real estate investors. They need to create a you know that they need to reach they need to create a power team. You know, of real estate brokers, agents, mortgage brokers, that that those types of people, and typically from those individuals is a list of referrals that they're able to tap into of general contractors, of painters, electricians, whoever it is that they need to use for their particular renovation, and is using those references to be able to find good quality contractors. If you don't follow that that process, then you end up with individuals that are not vetted and. Ultimately, you end up with serious problems because one of the things I hear is, oh, you can just go to your local home improvement center and and stand there and, and find contractors that way. And that's not the smartest way to go because who knows? It doesn't say on their forehead that they're losers, right? So in, in order to be able to find bona fide good people, you should start with with you know trusted references from individuals that you have a relationship with. And then from off of those, then you build off of that. Anyone who listens to this show knows that Green Property Management manages my entire West Michigan residential portfolio. They manage single families all the way up to large apartment complexes. Marty and his team are running a new special that I think is absolutely nuts. And I tried to tell him so, but he wouldn't listen to me. They want to offer new clients a $250 per unit project allowance to have their in-house licensed crew tackle any project, big or small, for new clients. I can tell you from personal experience that their unique management style will save you money, eliminate headaches, and increase your net operating income. You add on top of that this limited time offer of $250 per unit for new clients, and it really becomes a no-brainer. So text GREEN250 to 21000 or visit them on the web at livegreenlocal.com and tell Marty I think he's gone off the deep end with this absolutely nuts $250 offer. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. Building that power team of trusted contractors, that seems to be key. So what are some of the do's and don'ts when it comes to talking with and, and negotiating with contractors? One of the things that I'm discovering, especially now because of the this overheated real estate market that we're in, is that folks that are looking for work are seem to be falling into the trap of giving too much upfront. Then they're always behind the eight ball in terms of the progress associated with their project. You're hearing 30, 50, 7, I've even heard 70% upfront payments for work to be completed in a property. And once you're once you fork over that kind of money then it's awfully difficult for you to be able to gain back control over your project because ultimately at the end of the day, you control your project by by the amount of money that you give to your contractor. It should always be a situation where they complete work, then you pay. They complete more work and they pay. There should be a payment schedule and a progress schedule associated with your involvement with whoever it is, whether it's a general contractor or a tradesperson. And certain milestones need to be established even before anything is done so that we both parties have a clear understanding of what it is that you're looking to accomplish during a period of time and how much they should receive in payment after that. And that's where one of the, those are the things that should be ironed out prior to any, any engagement. 
and should be detailed. There should be a detailed scope of work. I'm a huge proponent of going through your property, identifying exactly what it is that you're looking to accomplish and getting all the specifications put together. You know, the colors of paint, the type of paint, the quality of paint, appliances, everything associated, even hardwood specifications. All of those those things should be decided upon prior to engaging contractors and tradespeople because you want to receive quotes from all of these parties and be able to compare apples to apples. If I were to take you, Brian, and if I took somebody else and I walked you through a property and I just pointed at things that I wanted to do versus having something written down, you would see that there's a, there is a, quite a bit of a difference that can result in terms of quote because things can get lost in, in, in swinging your hands around in comparison to having something written down that people can price out apples to apples to. What I'm hearing you say, Van, is that you need to spend the time before you bring in the contractors for the the estimates and the quotes, really dialing in on what it is you want, the specifics about the products and the quality of the products that you want to put in. But if you're a new real estate investor, you may not be aware of just how many choices there are out there. What advice do you have for someone who's just doing this for the first time who might need to rely on their contractors more? because they're not aware of these things. They need to do, there's just a matter of research that they need to do. And then they, there's, there's hundred dollar toilets and there's a thousand dollar toilets. Again, if you, if you don't, if you leave the discretion to a contractor trace fee person to be able to come up with, with their own specifications, then it's awfully difficult for you to be able to compare quotes that are provided to you. So you need to do that, that you need to get down and get that information figured out. And then oftentimes people will start at their local home improvement center and identify those items that they want to see. And you can clearly see there the every every one of those places has a spectrum, a wide spectrum of items that they can from low, medium to high. And so it's identifying those items and then putting the listing them in writing and then sending that out. That's the that's the proper way to go about it because if you leave it to discretion, you're going to have such wide varieties of opinion associated with what work should be done and the type of material that is going to be used. Should you spend some time then at, say, Home Depot before you bring in the contractors to really kind of like wander through the aisles and pick out the types of products and finishes that you should have in mind? Absolutely. I think that you need to have some, you need to have a basis of understanding. And when you're talking to a contractor and you're, you're negotiating with a general contractor or a tradesperson. And, and we're blessed to have so much information on the internet and also your local home improvement center. Back when I got started, we didn't have this, this thing called the internet. And we didn't have, well, in some pockets of the United States, back when I got started in the 80s and 90s, there were some you know, areas where there's home improvement centers, but not to the extent that they are, you know, the size that they are right now. You need to educate yourself. You need to get, inform yourself before you make that first step. Because if you don't, you're going to have to pay for that education one way or another. What are some other do's and don'ts when it comes to approaching rehab projects? Part of the process is to understand that every contract or trace person, there's limitations to the individual depending on what well, there's, there's goals that we have for a renovation that we need to identify the right contract or trace person that fits our particular, the goal of our renovation. So if the goal of our renovation is so that we, we are looking to quickly turn around a property and save money, then there's one particular contract or trace person that we're going to use versus if we want somebody that's going to be of speed and quality. So for example, if you're looking to quickly turn around a property, you need to use somebody that's a mid-sized, large-sized firm in order to be able to do that because they have the resources to be able to throw at a property to get it quick done quickly. But you have to unfortunately sacrifice on, on the costs associated with that. You're going to have to pay a premium for that type of service. On the other hand, if you're looking to economize and try to get something of quality, then maybe using a smaller contractor or trace person for that particular project is the way to go. But there are, there are fortunately, there's drawbacks to that because if you're a contractor and, and, you, and you have seven or eight projects on the go, it's difficult for you to bounce from one project to another because you're, you, know, you only have a small crew. And so those are some of the difficulties that you encounter as a real estate investor who you have to make that fortunate call. You have to make that call to decide what direction you go. And it can be in, 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 in their sacrifices that have to be made. Take us through a rehab project that you've done recently 
from start to finish? First of all, what is it? How did you approach it? And every step along the way, what was the outcome? There's a 22 unit apartment building that I purchased. I purchased it for 950,000. And it was a property that going in had rents of approximately $600 on average. And it was a building that required significant amount of work, as well as not only in the individual suites, but also in the common areas of the property. So there's a lot of work that's associated with it. I was able to factor in approximately $15,000 of renovations associated with the property. In that kitchens had to be replaced, the bathrooms, flooring had to be installed. Is that 15000 all in or per unit? Per unit. No, no, just per unit. I was able to, in a period of time, a six-month period of time, I was able to upgrade the units because I actually I inherited a building that was vacant. I forgot to mention that. And that was one of the reasons why price of the property was as low as it was. And ultimately, I'm envisioning being able to raise the, the uh, rents by $1,100, $1,150 over that period, over that six month, eight month period of time. Raise the rents $1,150. Is that per unit? You were getting 600 or it was getting 600. What, where do you think it's going to be? I'm going to conservatively say it will be somewhere on $1,100. So just almost doubling rents. This sounds like a significantly distressed property. Why was it vacant? It's in an area that's in transition, and it was a number of investors that had got together to purchase this property. There are some squabbles and issues associated with it, and they didn't have the funds to be able to carry the improvements forward. And so that was the situation. There you have the don'ts and the do's. They obviously were doing everything they shouldn't have done or did not really have the wherewithal to see it through. And you came in and, and now you're going to achieve this significant upside. Where are you in the process right now? We have completed it. And as we speak, the par- apartments are being rented out and it's, it's worked out well. So it's going to achieve your numbers? Yes. So you put $15,000 in per unit for significant upgrades. What specifically were those upgrades and what specifically did you do to the common areas? It's a walk-up building and it was broken, it broken up into four, four or five common areas. So there was all hallway corridors leading up into the apartments. But what I was able to, prior to us taking on the renovation, we did extensive research in the marketplace to figure out and determine what it is that we could get by with and what it is we needed to renovate. We were lucky in that in the bathrooms, there was already tub enclosures that had already been installed. And so it was just a simple paint and placing the flooring and vanities, brand new vanities with the, you know, the, the vanity kits that they sell with, with the mirrors and the countertop and the actual base cabinet. In the, uh, ba- uh, the kitchens, unfortunately, they all had to go. And that's where significant dollars were, were, were spent. Stainless steel appliances were the package that we put together. And then throughout the uh, flooring, we went with the LVTs and, and then obviously paint because I, I was fortunate in that we were fortunate in that the building was vacant. So uh, a larger crew could be brought in and just work day in and day out. We didn't have to worry about tenant issues or have to wait for tenants to, to move out. So yeah, it, it worked out well. Anything else when it comes to the do's and don'ts, mistakes you see a new investors making when it comes to rehabs or any other advice that you have in that area? I'm a, a proponent of folks be just establishing understanding of what their goals are, going out there in the marketplace and validating them. Once they've validated it, hopefully they, they, they go through an inventory of their property itself and determining what it is they can renovate or should renovate another time, other things that they shouldn't. And once they were able to get that, they create a detailed scope of work. And I think that's very important for them to do that on their own. And then ultimately, once you have that, then you get a, a tender it out into the marketplace. You identify general contractors, or if you decide to act as your own general contractor, you, you sub it out to electricians and plumbers and painters, and then you put that all together. And then really, if you want to maintain control of your pro- particular project, um, uh, you need to have a progress schedule and a payment schedule set, set up so that you can understand what the milestones are and, and you make payment on those as they're, as they're reached. The biggest mistake that I find with new real estate investors is that they don't, they, one of the mistakes are, is that they provide too much money upfront for, toward the, these contractors or trace people. And as a result, they lose control. And that's the reason why I use 
there's television shows that are out there that they're that dedicated to these bad contractors and trace people. And sometimes that is the case, but also to also it's these real estate investors and homeowners that lose control of it because they, they don't have clear defined strategies and goals associated with this renovation. And that's where you need to have both parties sit down and determine what it is that we're looking to accomplish and establishing all of that in writing. What do you say to investors who want to do it themselves and not hire contractors, but do all the work themselves? The common theme in the individuals that have, have taken that approach is that they won't do it again because the renovation that they envision that should take two to three months ends up taking seven or eight. They end up losing out on weekends. They end up losing all their free time during that period. You put a lot of stress on your family. And ultimately, yes, you do save money, but there's a lot of mistakes that people make. And I've seen them. I've gone into situations where I've been called to help people out and they've really seriously caused some damage to the property. Like it, 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 I've seen low bearing walls taken out. And the house is teetering already to collapse. I've seen investments that are made in renovations that they shouldn't have in terms of more than this. It over renovated. They've over renovated properties, and and they're pushing to try to get the maximum amount of dollars. And oftentimes, the smartest move might be to slightly renovate a property and take less on the back end. But you move the product. You made some. You made a profit, and you move on to the next. So Van, as we wrap it up, I mean, you've given us a lot of great advice about do's and don'ts of, of rental rehab. Tell us where you are now. It sounds like you've had a certain amount of success that you're now giving back and sharing this information. Talk about that a little bit and just how people can find out more about you and get in touch with you. If I've been very fortunate in my life to, and I've been very blessed and I have over the 30 years, I have created several businesses and I have employed great people. And I'll also partner up with some great people as well. And I've gotten to the stage of my life where I, I've sort of downshifted and I wanted to spend more time and time with my friends and family, enjoy, the, enjoy life. Because when I was in the grind, it, I was singularly focused on accomplishing and reaching my goals. And so I downshifted and I, I, I sort of have, I've got great people that are looking after my businesses and I became bored with myself. I, I was struggling to figure out I needed a new why. And so that's where I just several years ago, I was helping out a friend with their renovations on their, on their property and helping them through the process. And I enjoyed that engagement. And shortly thereafter, I came across a real estate investor friend of mine who was also you know, kind of an advisor or a coach that was helping real estate investors and engage them in conversation. And I told him of my experiences with, with this with being involved in this renovation. And he's like, oh, you'd be surprised at how many people uh, struggle with this, struggle with this whole process of... Because a lot of folks taking, they want to do this on their own, but they lack the framework or the structure or having a sounding board, an individual who's gone through it and have them have that individual involved in and maybe able to walk them through the process, like a, sh a shoulder that they can lean on. That's where I got started in this whole process. And I created this website and I've got a lot of content uh, on it that I encourage people to go on. And it's in there that I have got written articles that have been picked up by Google and places like that. And, and also a number of podcasts that I've been on where I preached a good word with regards to what's how to properly plan and manage a renovation. So I encourage folks to go on my website and they can get as much information as they can and be able to help them in, in this process. And the website address is? Vansturgeon.com. And spell that for us. V-A-N-S-T-U-R-G-E-O-N.com. Van, it's been a pleasure talking with you about the do's and don'ts of rental rehab. And I really appreciate you sharing your experience and your stories with us. It's good to get your seasoned and experienced perspective on the mistakes that people make. And I think you've shared some good information that will help newer investors avoid some of those mistakes. So thank you very much for having this conversation with us. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you very much for having me. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode 
episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, now offering a $250 per unit project allowance to new clients in West Michigan. Find out more at livegreenlocal.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 